So, um, I apologize. I'm a few minutes late. I got tied up, but um, uh, so I had some a, a couple uh, interesting things for you. So one is I wanted to comment to everyone about this uh, couple meetings I was at in the past month. Uh, one, uh, uh, Catherine and Molly were there and um, at the PERT uh, symposium. Uh, PERT is the Pulmonary Embolism Response Team. This is a uh, this is a concept created at the Mass General Hospital in Boston. Uh, the uh, thoughts of, uh, began with an interventional cardiologist who was called upon to respond to a, a PE patient in the hospital, and he was a long-term view became the goal to improve acute PE care for the patient. Um, this meeting this month was the third annual meeting, and uh, while there's a variety of topics discussed, uh, there was a dedicated session to the idea of um, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, depression, uh, and the general challenges around uh, the PE patients face after diagnosis and the, um, and the role of the support groups to, to help with this. And uh, so we had a session on that. And, and uh, I think everyone will be happy that the, the people involved with that discussion, uh, I recruited them to support the uh, uh, this uh, support group, this online support group. So there'll be some additional uh, additional uh, people uh, coming and giving you their thoughts over the next uh, several months, and um, and as well. And Catherine and I, you and I will talk about this. We talk with the folks at UCSD about uh, doing something for the people with the uh, chronic thrombotic and chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension patients. So uh, so. Uh, ways to help support more patients that have problems, that suffer from pulmonary embolism and are consequential. Um, we did have some lectures on today's topics, uh, so um, some of the content will reflect some recent thoughts at this, at this meeting. And uh, uh, but as far as a bigger review of PERT and and uh, and and what happened at this meeting, I, I, you know, I would suggest to uh, uh, Catherine Molly that. Uh, uh, I, Sounds like you already talked to Dr. Rosansky about uh, uh, doing a meeting. She's a hematologist from Mass General Hospital, and might, since she was an organizer for the meeting, and she'd be a good person to talk about PERTS and talk about relevant topics from the meeting that people, patients, uh, that's joining the support group would be interested in. So it'd be something to look forward to in the future. Um, the other meeting I attended this, this month was the uh, Garfield meeting. And I put the top line there, I put the um, the web address uh, for Garfield. Uh, there are two registries. Uh, you, you, uh, this group obviously will be interested in the VTE registry. And uh, Garfield is a is a uh, nonprofit funded by the um, UK government. And uh, and this particular registry, they are are, are following 10,000 patients that were. Identify within a month of their diagnosis of the VTE. So, a real uh, cohort to understand when, from the day you're diagnosed, how do, how do things proceed, looking at their collecting data on treatment choices, outcomes, the influence of certain patient characteristics, these types of uh, piece of information. And, um, and uh, their website will post uh, the information as it's released to the public. And uh, so, a place that, you, that uh, Members of this audience would be interested in going and monitoring for uh, for new information. Um, you know, I thought one thing I'd comment on. When, you know, so we are uh, from the meeting, which was interesting to me because it's a complex subject, is um, access to new medications. And uh, you know, they reviewed how people are being treated over a period of of years and showed uh, as these non-monitored. Uh, uh, oral anticoagulants, uh, the drugs other than Coumadin became available, how they grew in their utilization uh, across the world. And um, and it's very interesting to me because uh, now more than half the patients uh, with, with new blood clots are being prescribed, uh, the, the non-monitored oral anticoagulants with something other than Coumadin. And uh, it's also very interesting because the, um, excuse me. Oh, be 
because the uh, in the U.S. we are well ahead of the rest of the world as far as uptake and utilization of the newer drugs. Uh, different guideline committees have come out and suggested they be using preference to Kuna at this point. Um, and so I find it, I say it's interesting because, you know, there's all, always discussion around health policy in our country. And, and you know, it seems like every day I have patients that can't afford the newer medicines. Um, but, you know, but despite that, you know, we still have better access to these medicines than anywhere, than anywhere else in the world, which is a bit of a conundrum in my mind, uh, um, uh, how all that works. But uh, I'm not a, but um, uh, that I thought was interesting and obviously good news for the U.S. that we are getting better penetration of utilize, utilization of the latest treatment. Um, so on to today's talk, I had to cover those because they've all both occurred in the last month, so I wanted to fill a couple, a couple slides. And I only have a few slides, I'm not going to consume all your time looking at slides. I can give you lots of time to ask me questions or ask to speak with each other. But um, next slide is uh, is the concept of this follow-up after your diagnosis uh, with a DVT or PE. And um, uh, so I think first we want to think about what's your, what's the real goals of this period of time. So this to me, this we're talking about you have your PE or DVT and you get to go home from the hospital or ER, and, and now you're over here next uh, couple months for follow-up, and, and we want to make sure we assess you. And what do we want to do? Well, I think, you know, the goal, the primary goals from the standpoint of the PEDP are to determine your duration treatment and to identify at-risk family members um, because PEDP does run in families. And I think, you know, and, and the thought is to achieve that, uh, as we do with all, all medical conditions, we review the past medical history and the past surgical history. In this case, we look for injuries, medications that are associated with, with the illness and, and family history, of course. And how that works is, you know, what, what I think what we should be thinking in this setting is, in the past medical history, is there something that we know is associated with an increased risk of, of DVT? And the way, way, you know, the way I like to think about this is, uh, you know, if, for example, uh, commonly at our hospital, I'll see someone with rheumatoid arthritis. And uh, if you have, you know, rheumatoid arthritis and you have a DVT, uh, certainly your risk is increased, but as well, if your disease is, is not as well controlled, then your risk is increased. So I, so I examine patients, and if I take their history, and if I hear they have rheumatoid, I explore their rheumatoid, and if I find out that, Indeed, they their rheumatoid is because the sense of rheumatoid is poorly controlled. Uh, then, as I'm talking to them, I send a note out to their rheumatologist and ask them to go back to the rheumatologist, uh, you know, in the next couple of weeks rather than their next appointment, and rediscuss the rheumatoid care. And and the thought there is, that, you know, a lot of patients, if they're if a disease like rheumatoid is not well controlled, but you get it, you improve its control, and your thrombosis risk goes down. Um, and that's the way we think about these different illnesses, whether it be inflammatory bowel disease or an active cancer versus a cancer in remission. Um, you know, the activity of a separate disease is known to be associated with developing thrombosis. It affects how you think about their thrombosis, how long you're going to treat them. Uh, obviously, it makes you helps you understand it, what their you have a known risk association there or a provocation of it. Um, Another concept is, you know, medications, of course, you associate medications. Uh, the most notable and commonly used are the oral contraceptives. Um, very commonly we see, we see um, you know, young women come in with a DVT. They're on oral contraceptives. Uh, there's other less commonly used medicines, um, and uh, so I always take my time to sift through their medication list to understand if anything and the medicines they have are associated. Uh, we also think about recent hospitalization or surgery. Um, the, when we look at patients, more than half the patients that develop a DVT were in a hospital in the last 90 days. Um, so that is a big uh, pro provoking factor and, and, a re and what we call a reversible provoking factor. Surgery as well, associated recent travel, uh, you know, air travel gets the most notoriety, but uh, certainly we see people that, uh, after prolonged car travel that wind up uh, uh, 
with the DBT as well. Um, some sort of in injury that impacts mobility. The last patient I saw in the hospital this past week, uh, she, um, you know, she came with a DVT and and, and I was curious why it happened. And then when I talked to her, she sprained her ankle a couple weeks ago and then laid up uh, in, a, in an air catheter around her ankle. And, and so some sort of injury, particularly you know, ankle, knees, either particularly high risk, but something that impacts your mobility will increase your risk. Um, and then uh, family member, family history, particularly family members with age less than 45, uh, uh, raise the risk of some sort of inheritable um, hypercoagulable disorder being present. Uh, and so we want to think differently about patients uh, if you have another young family member with, with a blood clot. Um, imaging and labs, you know, we we would uh, uh, really target this on the um, Symptoms and or any any unexpected findings on the routine labs are done when the patient arrives in the hospital. Uh, routine cancer screenings are recommended, but more extensive uh, testing uh, without a basis, without symptoms to, to tell you to do, do testing without other test results abnormal um, are generally not recommended. And you'll see a variety of behavior among physicians out there uh, as far as uh, how to, how they practice, but uh, the general. You know, guideline recommendation that you know, or the you know, the groups of experts get to write around and sit around and write opinions. They generally don't recommend extensive uh, testing. Um, and then, but then we get into hypercoagulable disorder testing. Uh, here I've listed the different hypercoagulable disorders that we think about: inherited ones, protein C and F deficiencies, antithrombin B deficiency, factor V widen, prothrombin gene mutation. Um, and then antiphospholipid antibody syndrome is considered a acquired disorder uh, that you can that, uh, it can develop uh, as we age. Um, these probably represent about 15% of patients. You can see the vast majority of patients don't have one of these. Uh, of course, the challenge we have with this information is that uh, there's a variety of of statistics out there, um, giving anywhere from a prevalence of 5% to as high as 40%. In VT patients, but I think when you look at the bigger studies, 50% of patients is, is probably a, a reasonable estimate. And um, and then there's variation. Of course, there's variation in your practice. You know, I I think it, where I see patients, they're mostly elderly. I think their prevalence of these disorders is less. I think it's, it's more like less than 10%. But uh, but uh, you know, so there's some variation based on your location of practice that patients are exposed to. Um, testing. Is not routinely recommended because it doesn't alter your treatment plan, and doesn't alter your your, and, and that's because it doesn't initially alter your outcomes. And the issue here is that there that when we look at, and we'll talk about this more in a minute, but when we look at things that are associated with outcome, whether the blood clot was considered provoked versus unprovoked, is much more powerfully associated with outcome than any other factor than any of these blood tests if they're positive. So they're really, you know, the, the thought is they shouldn't be used in treatment decision making. Making You'll see some, I, I commonly see some hematologists will, will utilize it in their decision making, uh, but the guideline recommendation is that they should not be used in, in, in decision making. Um, so why would we do them? Well, we're more interested in the idea of genetic counseling for first degree relatives. So in other words, uh, you know, if if a if a um, patient has a, a young patient comes in with a blood clot, and uh, we test that person, and they have a teenage daughter, and they turn out to have a uh, inheritable disorder, and you test the daughter, and she has it too, uh, then that and it might then as they become of age, you might tell the person not, not to use hormonal birth birth control to avoid the risk of developing a blood clot. So, um, or Maybe they have, you know, maybe they have a son and he plays soccer and he injures his knee. And normally we wouldn't offer prophylaxis, but maybe in this case we would because we know that he's at an uh, increased risk. And while you wouldn't need routine anticoagulants at time of, of some sort of injury or some sort of uh, something that temporarily increases his risk further, uh, then we would want to use prevention, preventive medication. So these are, that's the thought of doing genetic testing, doing the, I'm sorry, the testing for a disorder. 
they inherited one of the particular family members. Um, and uh, uh, anti-clotting lip and antibody disorder is a little more complicated, and, and, uh, and so that one uh, may have more of an impact on your therapy, but usually you'll see other signs that, that they have that uh, disorder um, by their symptoms and so forth. Um, so who and when to test uh, for hypercoagulable disorders? So if, you, if there's a family history of, of someone, first degree relative, um, below the age of 45 with a blood clot, and it doubles the rate of one of these tests being one of the inherited tests being positive. Uh, probably comes in around 25% of people will be positive. And so there you have a much greater likelihood of finding a patient with a positive test. If you don't, if there's, if there's no family members you're aware of, then you think about it uh, in the younger patients, less than, by that find is less than 45 years old. Uh, thrombosis in multiple venous sites they're unexpected, so it's somewhere in the stomach, abdomen, and hepatic circulation, and the cerebral circulation. Uh, another group is people that, when they get put on warfarin, they get skin necrosis because they tend to have protein C deficiency. Uh, sometimes they have protein S, but most commonly protein C. Uh, if you have arterial thrombus or miscarriages, then uh, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome has been associated with those uh, um, conditions. And the timing of when to perform it, the thought is, well, uh, do it two to four weeks after you stop anticoagulation therapy. Uh, the problem is when you have a new blood clot, it distorts these test results. And when you're on anticoagulants, it distorts these test results. So they're unreliable when, if they're done when you first present, and they're unreliable when, you're, when they're done when you're on blood thinners. So if you do them then, well, then you got to re- a lot of times you have to repeat them later, and then it creates confusion because there's this, maybe a positive test result in the chart that doesn't truly represent the patient, but someone in the future doesn't know when the test was taken and what situation it was, and they think the test means the person has a problem. So, so, you, so the general thought now is we're probably better off to wait, let the patient get their three to six months of anticoagulation at a time when it's safe, uh, stop it uh, for at least a couple weeks, and then, uh, and then do these uh, blood tests on them. Um, and like I was alluding to, one of the reasons we do this is the idea of duration of treatment. And the most recent guidelines, American College of Chest Physicians, really focuses their energy on this concept of provoked versus unprovoked. And, uh, and the concept of can the provocation be removed. So, for example, uh, the, a, the unprovoked uh, blood clot is one where, you know, that's where the 50-year-old healthy person comes in as a blood clot, uh, and there's no clear reason why. There's no clear illness associated with it. They don't have any symptoms suggesting other illness, um, and uh, and so forth. The um, provoked blood clot. Uh, there we we talk about a little bit, but a lot of things provoke it. So if you have recent hospitalization, well, that would be what we call a a um, provocation that could be removed, right? Because Stay out of the hospital, and then uh, thought is you, you your risk goes down. Uh, if you had a recent surgery, especially the most commonly, most notorious related are the uh, hip and knee surgeries, um, the uh, uh, replace joint replacement surgeries, um, but uh, but uh, also uh, abdominal pelvic. Just about every surgery has been associated with, it, but particularly abdominal pelvic and hip and knee. Um, so uh, uh, there again, when you recover from the surgery, then your risk goes back down. Um, and we talked about other other provocations like active rheumatoid disease or active lupus or things like that. That uh, another one that gets a lot of attention, but it's a small portion of patients is active cancer. And um, and the general recommendation is if you have active cancer or you're on treatment for cancer, you should be uh, on. You have a history of a blood clot. You should be on blood thinners. But a lot of patients these days, they, their cancer, in effect, gets cured. Uh, you know, a year later, they're off, they've been off treatment for over a year. They have no, um, they have no signs of active disease, uh, and so their the thought is that they're probably in remission, and therefore, and their EBT risk goes back down again. And so that'd be a uh, provocation that could be removed. And, and so a lot of cancer patients, whenever it appears their, their cancer is in full remission, they get they can come back off their blood thinners. The uh, people with recurrent, uh, you know, 
EVT or PE, uh, um, their risk goes up significantly in the thought is they should stay on blood thinners long term, even if it's unprovoked. Um, we always have to balance our consideration of bleeding risk. Uh, you know, so ACPB guidelines uh, to, to the statements such that, well, if you have an unprovoked blood clot and you're at a high bleeding risk, well, you should limit your use of blood thinners. If you have a low bleeding risk, you might want to be on blood thinners indefinitely. And so we can see how heavily influenced we are by this risk of bleeding. And that risk goes up in a variety of conditions, but particularly with challenging, it goes up in the elderly, which, which, are, which uh, uh, makes it challenging to treat the, those patients. Um, the idea of first episode of unprovoked blood clot, though, this is evolving. Um, you know, we're seeing more recommendations to, to keep, to keep uh, even people with unprovoked blood clots on uh, blood thinners long term. Uh, I mean, keep the unprovoked blood clots on people long term, even if it's their first episode, rather than waiting for a second episode. It used to be that we waited until we saw that it was recurrent, but now a lot of got a lot of recommendations are coming out to say consider more strongly leaving them on from the first unprovoked episode. Um, what's notable is you know what kind of items increase your risk, uh, being in the man or healthy V dimer doubles your risk. Um, and then there was a recent study called Einstein Choice, which has a impact on. Um, which may have an impact on the guideline, guideline because uh, there was not as big of a difference between provoked and unprovoked recurrence rate of BVC. And so, uh, so we'll see. We may, uh, may uh, be treating uh, everyone the same uh, sometime in the future after further discussion. But that's a recent study, and, and uh, it's under discussion between the people that write the guideline and so forth as far as how, what kind of impact that has on our treatment decisions. I think that is all I wanted to cover. Um, I think uh, um, did want to comment. I don't know if uh, one of the NATF um, patient advocacy committee members was on tonight. If Martha was on, I wanted to give her a chance to open up discussion, but. Um, uh, but otherwise, I wanted to open up a discussion for everyone to talk. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Walker. That was um, a great kind of discussion or starting off point for discussion for, um, you know, what type of treatment is appropriate for patients after a blood clot. We did get several emails over the chat function and um, through the events email. So if you don't mind, I'd like to start with those. Um, and we can kind of take it from there. So I guess the first question is, if a patient, you know, is getting conflicting information from their doctors about the length of duration that they should be on anticoagulation, how would you recommend or do you have any resources you would recommend that they could use or, you know, journal articles um, to kind of help them, you know, make a decision about what's best for them? Yes, yeah, so this is a very this is a challenge I think in and 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 just rapidly it's probably a challenge throughout medicine now, but obviously this is a subject I'm very familiar with. Um, is this this concept that we are as we are everywhere in the world, we're rat we speed up the rate at which we collect information, you know, to this tremendous pace that is very, very uh Difficult and probably impossible for um, for you know doctors and probably all people to keep up with. And so, what you're you know, whereas in the past, you know, a study would come, new study would come out every you know five years, and, and, and guidelines could be changed. You know, guidelines were changed once a decade, and and you know. Uh, practitioners would slowly, would in a, in a rather unified manner, change their behavior. Um, I should say more unified. I mean, I think it's, there's always been variation in advice, but it, but I think it's getting worse uh, because of this issue. Um, I think now, you know, there's just so much information coming out so quickly. 
that you see. Um, and when you look at it, you know, statistically, when it's been measured by Institute of Medicine, it takes 18 years on average. Like when, when, a, when a new treatment comes out, it takes 18 years on average for it to become standard of care, so to speak, uh, with one commonly used term, but the most commonly used treatment in medicine. I mean, 18 years, right? And so now we have this acceleration of information, and it takes us on average 18 years to be, you know, taking it up, everyone that's taking it into practice. You know, obviously, you're going to see various behavior, very, very great variations in advice and behavior because one person reads uh, uh, certain sources of information but not others and, and vice versa among the different physicians out there. And, um, and so, yes, yeah, so you'll see, you'll go to patients, patients go to doctors and they get different advice uh, from the different doctors. And, you know, and when you read guidelines, they're very challenging too because they, they try to leave they try to give broad advice, but leave it open for dis discretion. And uh, and so, you know, if you're a patient and you try to reinterpret a guideline, it would be very, unless you're also a physician, but uh, if you're a non-physician trying to interpret a guideline, it would be very challenging for you to understand what to do and whether or not your doctor is giving you good advice. Um, so, of course, some of this is why we do these sessions so we can talk about these things and understand it better. Um, so I think, you know, I think, unfortunately, um, you're making decisions about your health care you know, the same as you're making decisions about everything else in life. You're getting different advice from some different people, and you figure out which one of those people you, know, you trust the most, and you figure out, try to, you know, you base that on, whether they listen to you, when you check up on their advice, do they tell you something that seems to be valid? Um, if they're, you know, are you know, are they, uh, are they addressing all your concerns, your needs, and uh, and then making that decision of which piece of advice you got, you know, sounds to be the best. Um, but uh, it's certainly challenging, you know, for the patients, and certainly. Uh, um, you know, and, and like I said, I think it's probably getting worse because of uh, the speed at which information is becoming available. Okay, so it sounds like basically you just need to find your doctor you trust and who's willing to, you know, make decisions with you and not for you, um, you know, and, and go from there because you're going to drive yourself nutty trying to interpret the guidelines and the onslaught of research that's out there. I think that's reasonable advice. Um, so I have a question from a 61-year-old man who's otherwise healthy, very, they eat healthy, very active. They had a CBT that happened seven months ago. Um, they've done a bunch of blood work. There's no signs, no genetic causes, no underlying issues. Um, they then came off Eliquis and um, they had a second clot in a superficial vein. So they want to know how can tests be normal yet they still have a clotting issue? Um, and they were told yesterday that their future is eloquent for life. And is there anything they can do to get off the drugs and back to a normal life? Yeah, so, um, yeah, this is sort of the essence of what we were talking about today. The idea that um, one is that you know if you go through these these various tests I talked about, you, know, you only have on average probably 15 percent chance of finding anything to be positive. And I think that gets into this idea that you know there's so much about the human body that we don't understand, right? Um, you know most most illnesses we don't have specific tests that demonstrate a uh, you know an increased risk. You know here. And DVT and you know thrombosis, we have you know that we know that prothrombin gene mutations associated with increased thrombosis. We know that um, factor V light deficiency is another gene mutation associated with increased thrombosis. 
Um, when we look at like coronary disease, we don't have any gene mutations we know are associated with increased risk of coronary disease. So, so, in, in, so although we only have a small portion, a test, these couple tests that identify a small portion of patients with increased risk, better than we do with a lot of other illnesses. Um, so, in that manner, you can then understand why, you know, most of the patients don't have any tests that identify their increased risk. It just demonstrates our lack of understanding of the human body. Um, so then you get into this other question of, of you know, you're being, of being told after a second blood clot that you should stay on anticoagulants the rest of your life. And the issue there is that, on, that the general thought is that if you have more than one DVT, that your increase, that your risk is quite high, probably in the range of 20 plus percent per year. And, uh, and you can lower that to, you know, 1% per year if you're on blood thinners, and, 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 and your risk of bleeding is rather low on, on those blood thinners. Therefore, uh, you should stay on them. And, uh, and so, you know, I think that sounds like good advice. Uh, you, know, I, um, you know, if you were, uh, I'm not sure which veins were involved or what have you, but, um, uh, you know, there is what they call the superficial femoral artery, which is not truly a superficial vein. So, you, so indeed, it would be a, a DVT, as we call it, um, if that's what was involved. But, um, but so yes, yeah, so if you have re, you know more than one episode of DVT, uh, the recommendation is to stay on blood thinners. That's something that's pretty common, pretty generally agreed upon. So I think you get that advice. You know, from the vast majority of physicians that you see, and um, and there, and you have to look, balance that risk of bleeding versus thrombosis, and without uh, identifying provoking factor, you know, your your risk of you, you know, it's, you would stop your blood thinners, your risk of blood clot would be quite high. So I, I'm not sure I you, you're going to have a way to get off the blood thinners, uh, unfortunately. But the good news is that. You know, with the blood thinners, you generally do quite well. I mean, lots of people live on these blood thinners for, you know, 30, 40 years without a problem. Uh, so, um, so uh, hopefully uh, with that, with it, you know, the health system can have a big change in your life. Great. Thank you. Um, our next question is about low-level light therapy or cold lasers. Um, do you know anything about using those as a treatment for the healing of damaged tissue or veins after a DVT, especially those with post-thrombotic syndrome? So I don't, I, you know, so these, this laser therapy to the veins of the, of the legs, um, uh, you know, I don't work at a vein clinic where we do that or anything like that. Um, but it's really a treatment for the, Superficial veins. Um, you're not going to do anything to the deep veins. Um, so you know, and but really, what you typically do though is you just destroy the vein. So some people, well, after some fibrosis, in particular, they, their superficial veins will get real swollen and they'll be painful because they swell because they enlarge uh, too much. So in other words, you have a lot of back pressure of the blood flow into these small veins, and they dilate and they can be rather painful for people uh, when they're on their feet for a little while because they swell up too much. Um, and basically what these laser treatments do is they take that small vein and they, and they, and they destroy it so that it doesn't collect blood anymore. And that way when you have some backflow into it, it doesn't dilate and stretch and, and, and get painful. And um, so that would be, um, uh, uh, that's uh, a treatment that Backflow into it doesn't dilate and stretch and, and, and get painful, and um, so that would be um, uh, uh, that's uh, a treatment that, like I said, I mean you destroy the vein, but it has a it has a symptomatic benefit to patients, and these small superficial veins are are not that are not don't seem to be relevant because they can do these to these small veins and not have an impact on your. Uh, what 
which alleviates your pain and, 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 and appearance of the leg, but doesn't uh, impact uh, the function of the blood return out of the leg uh, because it's mainly a factor of, of the large vein. Um, and so, uh, so some people do that with a, with a positive impact for them. Okay, thank you. Um, a woman who had a really horrible uh, reaction to Xarelto um, was wondering if there was any research done in um, senior, she's 68 years old, if there was any research done in seniors or in particular senior women um, about the dosage and if age can affect that and um, shouldn't people over a certain age be watched or warned about an overdose or side effects. So, um, yeah. So this, this is Xarelto. The um, so reactions to Xarelto and these other new medicines are, are uncommon, fortunately. Um, sorry that happened to you, but um, but it is uh, it is uncommon. Uh, so. The issue of dosing is an interesting concept to me, and the influence of age, of course, I think as you're pointing out, uh, certainly affects what we call bioavailability of any medication, um, and that gets into should dosing be the same for everyone. You know, the, these medicines have what we call a wide therapeutic range such that uh, if you have you know, a low serum level of drug. You know, if you're young and, and and a large person and you have this very high metab, you know, you uh, have very high metabolism, you can have a, a fairly low circulating blood level of a drug uh, compared to, you know, a nine-year-old that is, you know, at this point in their life rather, uh, you know, becoming rather malnourished because there's been and lightweight and so forth. Um, that, and, you have, and, and, and then there's other things that happen to your body as you age that increase the circulatory you know, concentration, so to speak, of a drug. And the good news with these drugs is that they seem to, this, this wide, because they have a uh, big therapeutic range, um, this variation seems to be tolerated well by a variety of patients, so the doctors can just use one dose for everyone. Um, but, uh, you know, whether that's ideal or not, I think, you know, is, you know, because there are some people that have, uh, that they, they come in and they, their drug levels are probably very high. Um, you know, but, so uh, whether that's ideal or not, I think is, more complicated question, and we don't really know the answer to it. We don't have we don't have commercially available you know ways of monitoring drug levels to adjust dosing. And even when we even when we do, we don't really know what the exact perfect range is to be in. Um, so um, so it makes these so uh, so on one hand the the lack of need for monitoring is provides added convenience, but on the other hand, it, um, you know, it creates uh, this issue that you're bringing up with the idea of uh, is, the, is the dose, the right dose, the, the same dose that we use in a 40-year-old, the right dose for a 9-year-old, um, and or is there variation based on kidney function. But on the other hand, it, um, you know, it creates uh, this issue that you're bringing up with the idea of uh, is, the, is the dose, the right dose, the, the same dose that we use in a 40-year-old, the right dose for a 90-year-old, um, and or is there variation based on kidney function, liver function, weight, sex, things like that that affect our metabolism. Um, yeah, unfortunately, we don't have, uh, we don't have great answers. Uh, we don't have great insight into that. Um, so, uh, so there isn't a, uh, a great answer for you there as far as, uh, I guess what you're thinking of is maybe if you were on a lower dose, would you have done fine on the Xarelto? And, and we really don't know the answer to that question. Okay, so 
sounds like an opportunity for some research. Yeah. Um, <laughs> a gentleman who is 26 months um, after having a DVT and a PE, um, he, unfortunately, the pulmonary embolism has kept calcified um, in his lower lobe, so now he's looking at UC San Diego for a um, thrombo and nerdorectomy, and he is on warfarin and oxygen. He was wondering if you knew of anything um, to what his options were other than living with an oxygen bottle strapped to his hip. Um, there are any pinpoint anticoagulants he can use, or you know, what are his options? Interesting. How old, how old is this uh, person? I did not say. Oh. So, you know, I think so. A couple of different th things here. So, so the issue here is um, first thing you have to sort out is is uh, is the um, chronic pulmonary embolism uh, the only cause of his um, hypoxia, you know, his lung dysfunction, therefore hypoxia. So um, the issue is that, you know, that some patients develop chronic uh, emboli where the emboli is calcifying and they fibrose in the, in the pulmonary arteries and never clearly clear out. The rate of this occurring is less, is, I think you could say less than 10% of patients, whether it's 1% or 8, 9%, I think, you know, there's been various information looking at this, but certainly in the range of probably, you know, and less than 10%, probably only range about 5% of patients. It's a small group of people that this happens to. Um, and then the other issue, of course, is, uh, is that the only problem with the lung? You know, so, um, you know, so if you have one area of some, of, of some chronic thrombosis and a lot of hypoxia, and then, you know, you were a smoker for 40 years, well, then, you know, it, it probably it's not contributing that much. Um, it's probably contributing a little bit, but the rest of your problems are probably more related with some emphysema. Um, that's just a common example, but then there can, there's obviously a lot of other diseases that affect the lungs. So you'd have to look and see if, if you think that it's really causing all your problems. Um, and then if it is, usually you have what we call, we, pulmonary, you develop what we call pulmonary hypertension. And there's usually more, if you have significant pulmonary hypertension, a lot of times there's more thromboembolic disease than you can really see on the imaging. And in that setting, that's where people benefit from the from surgical removal. And what they really do is they go in there and they do a endorectomy where they remove the intimal layer of the artery and uh, and all the fibrotic and thrombotic uh, you know clots within the artery. And when they're done, the blood flow through the lungs improves, and, and they go and they do this. Throughout the, the small, as far as, as far as they can reach in these smaller vessels and areas that they feel are involved, um, and when they're done, the blood, the, what we call pulmonary hypertension, the pulmonary blood pressure goes down significantly. The lungs are perfused better, and the oxygenation improves. Um, the other area that don't work in is the idea of um, of angioplasty to these areas where they can get into the actual. Um, fibroid tissue and really drill a hole through it and put a balloon in there and stretch it out and open up a blood flow to the area. Um, and so you know, these are w ways to, to deal with that as well. But, you know, so what they'll do for you as you head out to the UCSD is they will do a full assessment of what are all the reasons you could have problems with your lung. And if they find, you know, other reasons other than just they find you have a little pulmonary emboli, but a lot of but some other reason to have problems with your lungs, and obviously they treat the other condition. Um, but if you find that there is no other reason, and you, and you have um, signs like that there are different tests of having a significant amount of uh, chronic 
form amboli problems, uh, and they think that they can approach those by either surgery or angioplasty, and, and then they'll talk about those options and and uh, and, and you know and, and try to utilize those to improve the blood flow in the lungs, and and, and uh, they have good success. You know that they, they carefully choose the patients uh, to go through those surgeries, and, and but. Uh, when they do operate, they generally have very good success at lowering the, the blood pressure in the lungs and, and improving the oxygenation. And you know, people like yourself that are on oxygen, if that's the primary reason, they wind up coming off the oxygen. So portray a, 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 a good future. Um, and they see that, they've, they've seen that in, in people that are as young as 15 years old develop this problem. And uh, people in their teens and 20s, they'll do these surgeries on and up. I've seen these patients, you know, 20 years after their surgeries. And they started doing this in the 1980s. There are people that are, so, you know, when you look at mathematically, I think, as if, as, as, and if, you, if you look around 1990, there was only like 50 cases done. Uh, you know, UC, UC is the first place to do this. and, and they have the busiest center in the world. And if you look around late 80s, around 1990, they only had like 50 or 60 cases done, something like that. Um, but now we're here in 2017, and there's they've done almost 4,000 cases. And um, but, as you, but as you can see, if you think about, you know, 30 years ago, there were, well, it's hard to see those patients. There's very few of them that had the surgery done. But, you know, Starting 20 years ago, there started to be more of a volume. And I've certainly met some people that have had it in that range of uh, somewhere between 10 and 20 years ago that are, you know, have, you know, were very challenged prior to surgery, not able to breathe, using oxygen, and a long time later, they're doing well. So, uh, um, so it could, if you're a particularly young person, it could be very, it could be life changing for you. Great. So, lots of positive developments and, and room for optimism. Um, your next question is, so I'm wondering if you had a um, CBT and PE they were diagnosed in early April. They were told that the clot should resolve on their own within one to three months. Is it protocol to have a repeat CT scan of the lungs and ultrasound of the legs to determine if the clots are dissolved or is it up to the doctor's discretion? Uh, they would really like the peace of mind and knowing that the clots have dissolved. Yeah, so um, so two concepts there. I mean, one is you know, the idea of, you know, will, will they dissolve? And to our ability to see in the lungs, you know, the best test we have that is easily available that outlines the arteries within the lungs is the CAT scan. And so uh, the CAT scan, if you look six to 12 months down the road, um, you know, 95% of people will not have any identifiable remaining blood clot. So um, on that image, uh, that's the sort of limit of that testing. Um, but as you can, but so when you have a test from a P, PE standpoint, we have a we have a test that you know ninety five percent of the time isn't going to show you a result. The general thought is, well, we shouldn't be ordering that test. So, um, so certainly from a PE standpoint, uh, uh, the thought is that you should only do another CAT scan if you have symptoms that drive that, and and uh, that. that Courage to do so. So, if you have persistent breathing problems or recurrent breathing problems or something like that, then it'd be time to do a, a, another CAT scan. But otherwise, general thought is that you could be reassured that 95% of the time they won't be able to see any remaining blood clot after a long period of time. Uh, and the legs are more complicated um, because the rate of resolution, complete resolution in the legs, is much lower. Uh, a lot of people, after they have blood clots, uh, in the legs, um, you know, when you repeat ultrasound in the future, you can still see some blood clot. Uh, this is 
this is more, I mean, the risk is higher as you are older, as you're less mobile. Uh, there's some factors that influence whether or not you'll have some chronic residual clot, the size of the clot, the extent of the clot, so, such that a small person with a small, a young person, I should say, with a small uh, a clot, an area of clot, um, a lot of times that'll, they won't be able to find that again on, on repeat ultrasound. And, uh, um, but particularly an older person who's less mobile, who has clot from the side of the knee, or uh, the hip to the knee, a lot of times you'll see some residual clot in there. Um, and those are just relative terms, those aren't absolute, but, but so there you, so a lot of times there you can see some residual clot, but the reality is, again, that's never been correlated with a change in treatment. So if you had some residual clot there, the thought is, well, it fibrosed itself over, and it's just an area of, like a scar, if you will, to the vein, and therefore, and it doesn't affect your recurrence rates and uh, necessarily, the, you know, your treatment decisions aren't really being, made, being been made on it. And since we're not going to do any different with that ultrasound, I mean, we're not going to change your treatment, we're not going to uh, or any other testing and so forth, yeah, general thought medicine is we shouldn't be looking because we're not going to do uh, anything with a test and we, then we probably shouldn't be putting a patient through the test. Um, Having said that, uh, you know, if I have that conversation with a patient and they uh, uh, they tell me they really want to know, I've ordered ultrasounds to make people happy. Um, uh, so if that's your desire to understand what's going on in your veins, then, then I, I've, I've done that. Uh, locally in Maryland, there's these vein clinics, and they, they, you know, have people come in and do these ultrasounds in their legs. Uh, they'll do serial ultrasound to see how things do. Uh, I think that's more of a, um, you know, a business strategy than a, than a, than a treatment strategy. Um, but uh, um, but the general recommendation, though, is is you know that you that you don't do the repeat testing. The CAT scans, I, I generally won't do unless someone's symptoms. I won't do it just to reassure someone because. To get the CAT scan, you have to get exposed to radiation. You have to get exposed to the IV contrast. Um, uh, the IV contrast has a very, obviously, immediate risk to patients, whereas the radiation is a long-term risk. And so, so there, you know, you're you're you're, you're really uh, you're not treating off a harmless test to, to make the patient happy. Um, uh, but the ultrasound is, uh, you know, obviously doesn't have those factors. So, so. After all that, the short answer is, you know, that, that generally we don't recommend repeat testing unless there's recurrent symptoms. Okay. Um, a woman who had, she's 60 years old, she has factor five Leiden. Um, she had a DV scan of PE four and a half years ago after a long car drive. She was probably dehydrated but no other risk factors. She's currently only on baby aspirin, and she's flying to Madrid in September. Uh, should she be concerned, and does she need, would you recommend any rec any medication? So that's very interesting. Um, and, uh, and I would say maybe controversial would be the right term, maybe. Um, I think I personally there, so um, I'm not aware of a um, I'm not aware of a uh, you know agreed upon guideline recommendation off the top of my head. Um, I think you know my view is that I prefer prophylax someone in that sitting. So my view is uh, that you're at increased risk. You know, aspirin alone. Uh, there is actually studies done probably 20 years ago now called long flight. These were done by some Italian investigators where they randomized people uh, taking long flights at increased risk to use, uh, you know, low and blood thinner injection versus aspirin versus stocking and uh, and found that they uh, 
that the people that got globinox for prevention had a lower rate of blood clot development uh, on these long flights. And um, yeah, so I, so someone like you, I, I feel like you know we should do something for prevention. Uh, I generally use the uh, no, the, the, the non-monitored uh, as you call them. You know, they're now you can call them DOAX, direct oral anticoagulants. Um, but these are these uh, drugs that have you know whether it be Zeralta or Eloquist or you know Pradaxa, they have I, studies have prevention doses for orthopedic surgery. You know, so generally I would you know, use that uh, dose. But they you know they take effect within an hour or two, and so you can take them you know in the day before and after travel, or you know uh, to prevent reduce your blood clot risk. Um, and uh, that's something. Like I said, that's something that I believe in and I do. I think of, I think you get a variety of answers, though, on this uh, um, by doctors. I think most primary care doctors don't do that. Um, I think a lot of people like myself, that, like myself that work in this area and spend a lot of time thinking about it, you know, do recommend that. I think it's a nice way to handle patients like yourself because if we can you know, prevent the blood clot from occurring, then, then you know, your life's much better. And uh, it allows us to just use blood thinners at a targeted time rather than leaving you on them all the time. So, you know, that's my thought. Uh, whether your, uh, you know, whether your primary care doctor will do that for you, obviously, is up to them. But, uh, but, um, but that's how I commonly approach patients in a setting like yours. Of course, you know, I, I'm going with a little bit of information that Catherine read to me. You know, a lot of times though. You won't want to take advice from me because a lot of times you, know, you, go, you go to the doctor's office and then there's a whole different story behind there that I'm not aware of. So, so uh, that's why you want to talk to your doctors about about it as well. They might have very good reasons why they wouldn't want to ask, wouldn't want to do that. So. Okay, so talk to your doctor, but there are options. Um, would you consider a one hour? And I apologize if I butcher this word. Lithot. Lithotripsy, um, a possible provocation for DVT as much as three months later. Yeah, so that's interesting. Um, so, yeah, there's certainly the risk. So you have an increased risk of any sort of, any sort of procedure, but I agree that, uh, you know, lithotripsy, uh, you know, it would be a... Um, Lower risk procedure because they're, you know, typically there's not a lot of cut and sewing and immobility afterwards and so forth. Um, but you did receive anesthesia. You were up on the table. They're working your pelvis. You'll get some venous dilation during the procedure. Uh, they're doing some work on you. So all those things increase do create somewhat of a thrombotic risk. And the time interval uh, that's considered associated is a three-month time interval. So it sounds like you're right at the end of that. Uh, um, you know, we see statistically that goes down. The, first, the highest percentage of events happens the first 30 days and declines the second 30 days and the third 30 days. And then when you get out after 90 days, it drops down to, uh, you know, the rate of, as if you never had the procedures. Um, you know, so on a very technical level, then, yes, that can be, a, uh, that, you know, that could be associated. And the reason that's, the reason that's complicated is because of the whole issue of provoked versus unprovoked. And and so you really want to get into what you you know if you consider it a provoked event and it's, and it's disappeared and you know after you take three to six months of blood thinners you could stop it. And on the other hand, you know if for other reasons that you think if you know if you if you can if, if I look through a history like of your of a patient like yours and I find other reasons that I think that the increased risk might be increased. Then I might talk to you about, well, I'm not convinced this was related with this provoking event, and therefore we should really talk about staying on blood thinners. But then, and then of course, I factor in the patient's attitude towards everything. You know, if they're, they really want to get off the blood thinners, and there seems like there's some possibility that there was a provoked event, then I then we'll stop the blood thinners and see how they do, you know, versus some people are much more scared of the blood clot than, 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 than any bleeding problems, and it's not clear that was a provoking event. It's in the gray zone. And therefore, they stay on blood thinners. So, so you know, in summary, uh, uh, you know, that, that does wind up a little bit in a gray zone in, in, in 
the advice could go in a couple different directions depending on the rest of your medical history. Okay, um, a woman that was diagnosed with a DVT, she was put on uh, Xeralto for six months. Um, since then, she's found that she is heterozygous for factor V Leiden. Um, should she be seeing a specialist for her post-DVT treatment? And if so, what kind of specialist would you recommend? So, I think here, like the, I guess the idea here now is factor five wide and being positive and have, having a DVT. Um, and this gets into, you know, what we were talking about there. Um, and, you know, what, what the questions and the other questions were, what type of specialist to see. So these, you know, blood clots are becoming the, these, these, these blood clots are becoming most common cardiovascular illness, and and when they they involve things like hypercoagulable states, which attracts the hematologist to be involved. They are involving the cart you know the vascular system, which involve which you know cardiovascular doctors. Uh, some of them will be interested. Um, blood clots in the lungs. Some pulmonary doctors are interested, and the. Um, and then there's a whole specialty called vascular medicine, uh, which they're interested in. And so you've got all these different groups that are interested in know, know this information. And to me, which one of those you would want to see uh, if you think your primary care doctor doesn't know the subject well enough, um, which one of those you'd want to see in that setting depends on who's available in your community. You know, uh, uh, some communities, uh, like at the, the Brigham where Catherine is, the, there's cardiologists that are very famously involved with PDVT and, and, and are great people to see. Um, if you're over at the Mass General, they have a, their outpatient clinic was started by a hematologist, Salt Clinic. Um, you know, in, in, in my area, uh, uh, hematologists are probably the most notably involved. The, uh, the other groups aren't so interested in being involved. Um, and uh, uh, and so forth. So, so it depends on your community and, and who's available as far as uh, the specialist to give you advice. Um, and then the question of whether or not you need to see a specialist, um, I think it depends on your primary care doctor because this is very, these are very, these are very common. Again, this is a very common illness. So uh, when things are really common, a lot of primary care doctors study the, the subject enough to know how to treat patients. And uh, you know, so I, I, you know, I would, yeah, I would talk to your primary care doctor, and if they, if if you trust them and they feel comfortable managing the situation, then then you're, you're probably in good hands. Because like I said, it's, it's a very common illness. Um, but on the other hand, if if they say to you, you know, that if they, they think you should see someone else, then I certainly see someone else because they're telling you they they don't have they don't haven't kept up with the subject matter and, and want you to get advice from someone who's reading on studying the subject a little bit more than they are. And then they should be knowledgeable in your community which type of specialists are, are available uh, that are studying the subject and take good care of the patient. Okay, great. Um, two last questions because we're just about out of time. Um, what are the advantages of the new um, anticoagulants over Coumadin, and what are the disadvantages? Yeah, so when we say the new anticoagulants versus Coumadin, the four that are available in the market for, with FDA approval for treatment of DVTP are uh, Xeralto and Eliquist and Savasa and um, Pradaxa. And they are, at this time, the uh, American College of Chest Physicians and American, the different groups that write guidelines, American College of Cardiology and American European Cardi Cardiology Society, they actually recommend that we use those over top of Coumadin. And, I mean, uh, and the reason is uh, when you look at the math, uh, they have a lower rate of intracerebral hemorrhage compared to 
uh, cuminants. And it's consistent across all of them. And they have some variations in the rates of major bleeding compared to cuminin, rates of GI bleeding compared to cuminin. But what does seem to be consistent is that cuminin has a intrusible. If you look across all the studies, and there's been lots of studies, if you, you know, cuminin probably has intracerebral hemorrhage rate about 0.75%, somewhere in that range, well, less than 1%. And uh, these drugs, it's you know, probably 40% less than that, so it comes in around 0.4%. So these are very, this is a very small difference, but of course, when it's intracranial hemorrhage, that's a very attractive thing to avoid. Um, so because of that, uh, uh, those drugs are recommended in lieu of, of Coumadin. Uh, the disadvantage is that, you know, it's a trade-off. So one is they don't need to be monitored, but in a way that's a disadvantage because, you know, some people uh, have less metabolism of, of them than other patients. So so they get their drug levels probably get kind of high in the bloodstream. And other patients might have recurrent DVT because maybe their blood levels are too, a little too low, but we don't really have ways of monitoring them. And, you know, so that's, that is a... So a lot of those patients, we convert them to Coumadin in that setting because we know the Coumadin we can at least 60% of the time keep them in the right range that we want them in. And then uh, um, and then the other disadvantage of the newer drugs is that in people with kidney or liver disease, metabolism of the drugs, when they're not being monitored, is, is rather destructive because they, you know, you're not monitoring them. And if you have kidney or liver problems, they, they, they might not... Uh, your drug levels might not be as reliable. There are dosing adjustments for people with, you know, kidney disease, um, and uh, um, that accommodate for that. Uh, liver disease, mild liver disease, not a big, probably not a big deal. But advanced liver disease have all been excluded from the studies for these drugs, so you don't want to use them in that setting. Whereas the Coumadin, once again, you can tell how they're doing because you're monitoring it, and so forth. So. So, so there's some trade-offs, but as a generalization, they're recommended for the reasons I said, because of bleeding reduction in cerebral hemorrhage. And, um, and we're seeing that, like I said, as I said early on, we're seeing that they're being prescribed the jury at the time now in the United States for patients with new uh, need for blood thinners. Okay, excellent. And the last question for the evening is, do compression socks really make a difference in terms of preventing DVT? Oh, so prevention, the answer is probably not. But years ago, there was, so there's different types of compression stockings, but the most, the most aggressive ones, the, the, um, uh, Graduated compression stockings, they are, you, know, you're made, you have your leg measured and you're fitted for them and, and they give you a lot of pressure throughout the leg. Years ago, there were some studies suggesting a small decrease in the rate of DVT. Uh, um, I think over the years that the affection for that strategy has declined, particularly because people have a lot of skin breakdown because there's two too aggressive against the skin um, as well future you know as we move forward or the data was less compelling that they actually get benefit of patients at all um, so while there's a little bit of a hint that maybe there's some benefit there I, you know I, it's, it's uh, you know it's not clear that it's a true benefit and, and, uh, and certainly has been offset there's other better options to, to be used uh, for people um, Certainly, they're useful for, you know, symptomatic swelling, if you can tolerate them, uh, both from a discomfort as long as you don't have skin breakdown with them. Um, you know, like I said, some people will say there's a, there's a reduction in, in rate of DVT based on some old science uh, that was performed for them. Uh, but like I said, other people say that's not true based on more modern science. I think there's a little bit of open debate there, as I said. But... Um, uh, but in general, we're not recommending the use of them as a preventive strategy at this point in time. Okay, excellent. Well, that is um, the questions that we received for this evening, which I think 
Encore. A really excellent group of um, questions. So very much appreciated, Dr. Walker, for your very thorough responses. Um, very much appreciated. Um, do you have any parting words for the group? Oh, I just want to thank everyone for joining tonight. And hope it was helpful, and uh, and you know we appreciate any feedback how we can improve this. If you want to send it on to us, that'd be uh, that'd be much appreciated. Absolutely, and, and feedback really is so appreciated. We can't improve things if we don't know what we need to um, work on. So please feel free to contact me or my colleague Molly uh, directly, or you can just email the event at NACF online. Um, email address. So thank you so much, Dr. Walker. This really was terrific. Um, and I believe we will have you back again um, closer towards the end of the year.